So but, but the point is, once the Australian firms have gone, mm -hmm. you open up the space for the monopoly rents to be created by the external firms so, coming in. So all of this is part of the history. Um, if there were still Australian firms, they couldn't be charging those rents because of the alternative. And again, my point is, that it's the same point, it's a very complex picture. Um, the lady on your left was talking about supporting um, staff in retail shops. If Zara wasn't making whatever profits it is, could it have such a large range of stores around the, around the world? And if not, then where do those people work? Where do you start? Which, which block do you pull out of the huge structure that, um, that we're talking about? So we're not talking about now trademarks and copyright, we're now talking about um, economic analyses of the way in which um, you run your country policies on tariff protection, quota protection, barriers to entry of products, of which IP is just a smaller part of the world. Again, for those, anyone who ever reads the transcript of this stuff, I hope no one does, let me stress, this is, I'm right out of my depth in this economic analysis stuff. This, this is not my ex, um, expertise. Um, I'm meant to be an IP lawyer. Uh, are there other IP-based questions or other questions that I can answer? Well, let me keep going, because I, I, I don't think there's anything I'm going to say, um, thank God, one of my slides cuts across my answer to the questions I've already given. I've been saying, and a number of lawyers have been saying, and a large number of my clients have been saying, sorry, start again, a lot of my clients have been saying, we want to prevent power importation. And whether it's to make monopoly rents, whether it's to pay their staff, whether, for whatever reason they've been saying we want to stop it. I've given you some of the reasons, and as has been made clear earlier, others just want to keep their monopoly rents high, apparently. Some of us have been saying we don't like the fact that the laws have been changed without the in-depth analysis that we think is essential. Um, I have an enormous time for Alan Pearls, a very smart man. Um, but I, don't, but I know he didn't do the analysis that I think is needed now. There has been a reference by the government to this organisation called IPRIA, Intellectual Property um, uh, Research Institute of Australia, looking at one section of the Trademarks Act, and it's a section dealing with power law importation. You remember that I talked before about this Montana Tyres case where a foreign manufacturer assigned his trademarks to an Australian distributor who could then say, the products did not have a trademark supply to them because I, the Australian distributor, didn't put, wasn't me put trademarks on the tyres. Well, the suggestion has been made by the Trademarks Office, which is part of IP Australia, that if we are needed to look at um, whether change is necessary to our legislation to close that type of loophole. It's a very, very narrow sliver of, let's look at closing the loophole to maintain a government policy to allow power to importation. But a number of people, myself included, have said to IP Australia and IPRIA, we want a much broader review of power importation. And the response from IP Australia has been, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to recommend a higher level review because we are here merely to execute government policy, which is supporting power importation. The review has sat dormant in IPRIA for three years or two years at least because IPRIA is a privately funded organisation and doesn't have the money for this review. And hearing the comments made this afternoon, the review, instead of being that wide, could be like this. Um, at what point do you stop if it's as broad as perhaps we've been touching on today? Um, there are a number of trade organisations that I do work for um, or work with which have been saying, we want to change the laws to prevent power importation. I've been saying to them, no, 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 stop, don't lose credibility, that's monopoly rent type stuff. I'll support you if you say you want a review to determine should power importation be stopped. If they're saying, okay, we, we agree, we want to have this review, we, we think there's enough basis for convincing the government to prevent power importation, and we, we are happy to get on whoever's prepared to head up the bandwagon, so we're ready to go. The Intellectual Property Committee of the Law Council of Australia has also been saying we want a broader review. And I've been part of saying that. I, I want the government to re-review the policy. And I said, said earlier, there's numerous complaints. Um, be it people who 
Some might say making monopoly rents, be it those who are saying we have to lay staff off. I'm not going to be judgmental as to why they're saying it. They're making losses, it's hurting them, their brands are suffering, you <coughs> complaints from consumers, their cannabis mixed in with their products. There's a whole range of seriously genuine reasons why they're complaining. And they're saying we, we want to change the law. And the, those that I've spoken to are on board with the idea of we need to review the law rather than change the law. Hopefully to get a change, at least review the law. And what is it? And when I was asked to, um, by Pascal to, to talk today, it was about lobbying and, and what does one do? Um, what's the bigger picture? And my comments are um, as follows about lobbying, what one needs to do here. And I'm not telling you how to obtain a particular goal other than to obtain a review. But the first thing is, there's no point going to IP Australia, the Intellectual Property Office of Australia, the, the Patents Office and Trademarks Office. They've already told us as recently as a month ago, they're just going to enforce government policy. That's interesting because often they'll lead policy, they've got policy advisors in-house at IP Australia, who will commonly come up with recommendations from what happens overseas. Here, they've gone back to the, um, the old-time old defence of, we don't make policy, which I don't believe, we just enforce it. So they're not going to buy into that. Um, secondly, there's no point being a lone voice to government. I've seen it happen on the anti-counterfeiting laws. No one has put forward a legitimate reason to support counterfeiting, but the government wouldn't make strong laws against counterfeiting, using the argument, well, we've got 20 different people, 50 different people, maybe 50 different presentations, we're not going to do anything until you've got one voice as to what you want done with our anti-counterfeiting laws. And to a large degree that was done um, about five years ago, four years ago, we now have a, we now have a better set of anti-counterfeiting laws to come in place March of next year. So being a sole voice, or being 50 sole voices going to government is not, is not going to get you anywhere. The way to do, the way to lobby the government is, in this area is to, is to have a loud voice, a group of voices together. And the group of voices, voices needs to be, again, I think it's the same version of the point that you made, um, and which is you need to be an Australian voice. There's no point lobbying government if you are a foreign manufacturer and don't have a single Australian employee and don't pay taxes in Australia. Nothing wrong with being foreign based. Most of my clients are foreign based. But if they pay taxes in Australia, have employees in Australia, have an infrastructure in Australia, the government will listen because you've got Australian employees and that's really important. So 20,000 foreign companies, 200,000 foreign companies just sitting into Australia won't sway the government one, one iota. 200 Australian companies with bases here, with employees here who pay taxes is persuasive. And they're the ones to, to be gathered together. Um, again, consistent with what I said, thank God, half an hour ago, don't try to change the policy in your family. Don't say this is what the law should be. This is way too complex. Um, yes, I'm an IP lawyer. Yes, I want the IP laws to be strong. But they need to be logically strong, enforcing a logical um, economic argument, which isn't necessarily one dictated by economists. You give me those economists in the audience. Um, I don't want economics run by assumptions. I want people to look back at what has happened over the last 20 years where um, there has been power importation and to make judgments based on what has happened and then to make predictions on what has happened as opposed to making presumptions as to what's likely to happen based on economic textbooks. And what has to be done now, because the government has a report on which they acted, government Successive governments, Liberal and Labor, also we have a policy that's based on a very well-fashioned report by a leading economist. As I said, Adam Fells is absolutely top flight. I may not agree with much of what he says, but he is top flight. And there are a number of touch points. One, his recommendations weren't based on empirical evidence. And even if they were, that's 20 years ago. Times have changed. The internet wasn't a force 20 years ago. That alone is sufficient to say that we need to at least look at it. Um, what about the other countries? We've, we haven't changed, but the other countries' laws have changed. We are out of step internationally. Um, and thus, what I say we ought to be lobbying for is to say we need to revisit the laws on power importation. Of course, the companies who want to do this want power importation prohibited. That's obvious. But they can't get it by saying we want it changed. You need to have an analysis done. So, as I said, the key is not to tell government that what the current situation is wrong. They have to say, what do you know? Here's the report we've got from Fells. 
for the Swede government to review the matter again. Look at pricing. Has it fallen? Where has it fallen? Do you want to take into account what you're saying is happening with monopoly rents? That's not a factor to take into account. There will be voices that go each way. Even the, I mentioned the Intellectual Property um, Committee of the Lord Council of Australia. Um, we try to organise a meeting, try to group that group of lawyers together, as I've heard in CATS. We have different views on our committee as to whether or not power of importation is right or wrong, should be allowed or not. But ultimately, if the right studies are done, government will need to make a choice where they've got dissenting views. But you need a um, review carried out. And that's what I think is, is the key issue. Gather people together to argue to government to have a review carried out because the old review wasn't based on facts, it's 20 years old, and the uh, WTO agreements hadn't even been signed for God's sake in 1992 and 1993 when the report was issued by Alan Fells. Marrakesh was still a year away at that point the Marrakesh Agreement, that is. So it's fundamental, I think, to go to government and say, we want you to re-review matters. And then if you want to change the law, the next fundamental thing is be prepared to put time and effort and money into doing the research and producing evidence and facts and figures, not just, oh, I want the law to be changed to protect me. That's not going to get anywhere. So that's the, the fundamental issue. The, the IP legislation um, currently says power of probation is allowed and should be allowed, and that's government policy. A lot of people want the law changed, but you can't change it by saying it's wrong. You need to change it by lobbying for an analysis to change an existing policy. Are there any other questions? Sorry, everybody. A question and a comment. Um, on your last strategy um, issue, I think there's a question with some of the firms that things that are purported to be equivalent commodities are in fact not because the factories are now located in a lot of different places and, and in Europe you're buying a product that is ostensibly identical made in Slovenia and here you're buying the same product made in Guangzhou and they are in fact different yep. um, and they're different in some subtle ways and so it's not the same thing that's being purchased which you include in your presentation yes. but, I think that's a but people aren't understanding the way these commodity chains are now configured and how important those changes have been. And that goes back to education that the lady in the back mentioned which is letting consumers know the power of importation doesn't mean you get the same thing you can buy in Target. It's not on the tag, so they don't have to put that on the tag. That can be concealed. There's no, license, so, no laws about what, how you have to market or brand products that are power imported. The second thing is a true question um, from your knowledge of, of overseas brands. Can you tell me why they don't charge freight on individual internet purchases? Because that would balance back all the prices. No, I can't. Not, not, not I won't, but I can't. I, I, even the companies with which I've been working very closely, I don't get to talk to the policy makers at that level. So I just can't answer that. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. Yeah, that helps some items and that has dramatically left it. Thank you very much. Well, very interdisciplinary as well, I think. Otherwise, I go to sleep. That's very embarrassing when I'm talking. <laughs>